Okay. Oh yeah, I hear you fine. Okay, we're well, just gonna be looking at me. Okay. We're gonna roll into this. So how old are you now, Ed? I'm 76. So what year did you go to Korea? Uh, 1950 to 51. So help me with the math. How old were you then? 21? I was, uh, I, well, when I say I went in uh, when I was 17, uh, just turned 18, I was 20 years old. Okay. First time in the military, obviously, did you enlist? Did you oh yeah, enlisted. I, I enlisted for three and uh, they gave me an extra year to, uh, to stay in Korea. Did you, uh, when you were going through your basic training to, be, to be, become the Marine, were you thinking about Korea? Did you know that you might be going to Korea? Or oh no, Korea didn't even exist. You know, it was, uh, it was uh, five years after World War II, uh, the military was being completely dismantled. There was no wars on the horizon. It was uh, just, uh, you know, it was sort of like I was very adventurous and let's go in and see the world type thing. No, no uh, uh, thought process of any combat whatsoever. So when, when did it all come about in 1950 to where you actually found yourself on your way to Korea? Well, uh, I had the good fortune of, uh, of uh, spending two years, you know, I enlisted when I was 17, turned 18. I had two good years of uh, training uh, prior to uh, that. And uh, uh, we used to go to Vieques a lot, which is the island off Puerto Rico, and we used to use live fire, uh, you know, ships. And, uh, and I tell you, I was in communications and a forward observer. So uh, we used to fire the big ships and, uh, and the airplanes on targets, etc. And this is from 1950 to, to uh, I mean, 1948 to 1950. In uh, June or July, when, uh, when the Koreans attacked, whatever, the North Koreans attacked, uh, uh, General MacArthur, uh, you know, w was because the only army they had was stationed in, in, uh, in Japan, and they were, uh, they were occupation troops. I mean, they were PX and they were this. There was, there was no combat troops in Japan to speak of. And these are the guys they gathered up and threw them into Korea to, to Pusan, and they got shot up pretty badly. And uh, that's when MacArthur decided, you know, he made this uh, brilliant uh, strategy move to, uh, to land at Incheon, which is in North Korea, uh, I mean, in north northern part of, of Korea, uh, just outside of Seoul, uh, to, uh, to have an amphibious landing. And he specifically, because he had... Uh, um, experience with Marines in his Tarawar and all these places. He knew the Marines were the best uh, outfit to, uh, to handle amphibious landings. Plus the fact that uh, all you did in Marine Corps was train. I mean, it was discipline and training, uh, which, uh, you know, you, you don't, it's just a way of life and you, and you do those types of things. And uh, so when it came to actually going into combat, I was, you know, I was so well trained, it was just like, you know, I didn't have to learn anything. It was, uh, it was just good, uh, you know, it was a good feeling. You knew what you did. Uh, we landed at, uh, uh, there was three regiments. They brought one regiment in from the Mediterranean, which on, was on a med cruise. And they had another regiment that was stationed in, uh, in uh, 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 North Carolina. And then they put the third regiment, they had a makeup of, of I'd say, the, whatever, Marines they had. They only had, I'd say, about 120,000 Marines in the whole Marine Corps. That's all it was. But they were probably the best well-trained military that, uh, that n not disparaging the Army, it was just that, you know, it was a small core of groups that, that they were unable to train. So uh, uh, they sent the, uh, the, the occupation troops to Pusan, which is in southern uh, Korea, and, uh, and we made an amphibious landing at Incheon, and, uh, and then when we landed, it just changed the whole complexity of, uh, of the war at that time. And we, t we captured Seoul, and, uh, and the army moved up from the south, and it gave the army more time to bring in more troops, et cetera. And, uh, and, and uh, then, you know, there was the 38th parallel thing, which, uh, which was the, the, the World War II division of Korea. You know, all throughout our Cold War history, when we, after World War II, when we uh, defeated the J Japanese and the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Germans, uh, we got into a confrontation, which is the start of the Cold War, with the Russians. And the Russians, we always split 
down the middle. In other words, East Germany from West Germany. We split it and we had American zone and, and English zone and the Russian zone. Well, the same thing happened in Korea. They split Korea in half and the, the North Koreans became the communist nation and the South Koreans became our uh, responsibility. So that's how that split happened. It was just a geomet a geographically done. And uh, so uh, MacArthur was a general at the time and, and uh, he indicated that, uh, you know, that uh, it would be best if we took advantage of our victory in South Korea that we took the rest of Korea and made Korea a one nation again. So he advanced his, his army north of the uh, 38th parallel and uh, what we did with the Marine Corps, they put them on boats and we went all the way around the, uh, the, Korean, the Korean Peninsula to a place called uh, Wonsan, Ham Hung and Wonsan. And uh, we landed at Wonsan, but the, the uh, uh, Korean army had moved up the east coast and they passed, bypassed where we, where we were supposed to make a combat landing. And when we landed at Wonsan, it just so happened that Bob Hope was playing there. And of course the Marines took a hell of a ribbing on that, you know. What happened is they had, the, the harbor was mined and we had about uh, a week and a half we had a circle. So we couldn't land and, and the North Koreans were running so fast that the, the South Koreans uh, pushed them. And, and then Bob Hope came over and did a show. So we landed and, and Bob, you know, we started marching up and uh, of course, the army guys were giving us what for and hell and whistling and whatever. And uh, so anyway, we marched uh, and, and uh, uh, General MacArthur had the, uh, the strategy in Korea that uh, the, uh, uh, the army was going to take the left side of Korea, the peninsula. Uh, the Marines would be on the, in the central core and then the, uh, the uh, rocks, which are Republic of Korea army would be on along the coast. And uh, my organization was, uh, it was called Anglico, Air Naval Gunfire Liaison. And what it, this is something that evolved out of World War II and uh, they put it into effect in 19, uh, 1948. They just started it where you have uh, a communica small communications group and you have an a artillery officer, a, a pilot, an actual pilot, combat pilot, and a, and a naval gunfire officer, navy officer, and uh, when and they had them at the battalion level, which is way down, and and they would put these people really at a company level, and the whole concept of uh, of uh, the Marine Corps always has been uh, all the supporting arms are to support the troops on the ground. They don't go bombing cities, or they don't have this, or they don't have that. Everything is to support the troops on the ground. And uh, so the air, uh, they had uh, close air support, which is what they call, and uh, where you would be in contact with, uh, with the airplane, with the, with the guy in the, uh, in the pilot, and, uh, and they would come down right over your head. And, and, but they knew each other because the pilot flew with this group. And the naval officer was, uh, was a, uh, an officer aboard, you know, he knew the ship, et cetera. And of course the artillery was, we had our own artillery. So uh, that was the function of my group. We just provide the communications for all of this. And, uh, and uh, so, so when we landed, we started going up, you know, and, and it was, uh, I remember distinctly, it was uh, Home, home for Christmas drive. We were all going to go up to the Yalu River, which is the border between China and Korea, and we're going to, you know, put our please, you know, that'll be our line of demarcation, and uh, we everybody's going to re be rotated back to uh, to uh, the states, and and the, the Koreans would take over, and there would be peace in in the Korean Peninsula. That was the strategy. Well, on the way up, uh, you know, we kept hearing uh, reports on the radio that, uh, you know, Chinese uh, <laughs> were talking on the radio because we could hear them communicating, you know. And uh, one of the things that, that I know uh, saved me and saved the, really saved the Corps and all the guys in the Marine Corps is, uh, uh, and you, you could opt this out if you want, but, uh, but there was a real... Uh, uh, 
argument between the, the commanding general under, under MacArthur. MacArthur said, I want you people up there by Christmas. Uh, the second in command is exec, was uh, General Almond, A-L-M-O-N-D. And uh, all the, uh, the forces reported to this General Almond. So he wanted uh, to, we had three Marine regiments. And uh, he wanted to send one regiment off this way and one regiment off that way. And in other words, split the regiments. But we had a, a General Smith, who was a general of the, uh, of, the, of the division, Marine Corps division. And he said, you know, it's dangerous. Bad things are going to happen. I'm going to keep my regiments together. And uh, he indicated uh, that I'm ordering you to, uh, to do what I'm telling you to do. And there was a discussion, and, uh, and the Marine General said, I don't report to you. I report to the Secretary of Navy. I mean, it, was that, it went to that extent because he felt real strongly, uh, strategically, that bad things were going to happen. Because we knew from our, from our uh, reports, et cetera, scouts, that the Chinese were pouring in across the border. And to split the regiments, uh, we'd all been decimated. But uh, it was resolved. I think it did go. And, and I think MacArthur backed up, said, you know, let him go do what he wants to do. And he kept his three regiments on this one road going up. And he had... Uh, he pre-positioned the supplies at different places, you know, so if something drastic happened, he could get out of there. But they kept pushing forward and, and, and uh, maintaining the objective. Uh, and I remember uh, my first major uh, combat in that, in that one area was, uh, and bear in mind, I was a communications guy, I had a 45, and, and that's what I had. So uh, we were up on top of the hill, and this is just before it got cold. It was getting cold. It was about uh, uh, 20 degrees or something, but it wasn't sub-zero yet. And it was on, there was a hill, and the, the, uh, the combat guys the, were in the front, and of course headquarters of the company was behind, and, uh, and uh, you know, we kept seeing on the, on the ridge line all these little bodies running up and down the hills. And, uh, and we got a little bit concerned, but we were on top of, you know, up at company level. A company is about 120 people. And uh, so uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I was in my sleeping bag, and, and a guy nudged me. He said, you better get up. They're coming. And I remember that to this day. And I said, who's coming? What's going He says, get the hell out of your bag. You know, we're in a sleeping bag. <laughs> got sleeping. And just at that precise moment, I hear the, the, the uh, we had a 50 caliber machine gun at the front of, front of the hill, and, blah, 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 and then it jammed. And then you hear, you know, we just like the movies here. Rah! And the horns were blowing, and, uh, and uh, they overran the hill, and the Chinese were, were bumping into me, you know. And, and I had a pistol, but I didn't know who to shoot because I didn't know who was good and who was bad, and I didn't have my shoes on. So, uh, you know, <laughs> Talk about, uh, you know, what to do, you know, because you, you don't have any training for that. It just, you know, you got to react and use your guts. So, uh, uh, you know, there was about four or five of us got together and we went halfway down the hill. And then, of course, we were going to go back down where, where the battalion was down in the valley. And all of a sudden everything stopped. They, they had overrun the hill and they really shot up the place. And I, you hear, they used the little horns for, you know, these eerie horns. And you hear the horns on the top of the hill, and then all of a sudden we heard horns on the bottom of the hill. And, uh, you know, and we said, you know, we better, I said, we better stay here because I don't know which way to go until something, until daylight, till we can find out what's, what's up. Because it was five, five, you know, guys that I had never seen before. You know, they were just part of the, the outfit, but we, you know, we decided this collectively. We were all, you know, enlisted men, no officers or no, no sergeants or, or anybody in charge. But uh, because of the training we had, et cetera, it, you know, it, at any rate, when, uh, when, uh, when daylight came, it was, uh, you know, what, down, down in the valley. And, and a lot of times you, you tend to block out the, uh, the real nasty stuff. You don't block it out, but, you, you know, you just don't dwell on it. But you remember some of the humorous stuff that this Korean tank came up the road and, uh, and the Marine Guard you know, he, he jumped up and told the guy to turn his lights out because it was, you know, it was a Korean tank. Then the guy opened up with a, with a 50 caliber from the turret of the tank, you know, and this is where the, colonel's was, the colonel was down there. 
and they were all running and, and scattering and, and uh, it must have been funny, but we all chuckled because, you know, <laughs> they don't usually get under attack in battalion level. At any, at any rate, they, uh, the, 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 even the, China, the Chinese tank didn't know who, who, who was there. What happened is when the Chinese were coming down, they were, they were fighting the, North, the South Koreans, and the South Koreans at the time were very, you know, they broke and ran. They didn't fight. I mean, they weren't trained, and they were just poor souls. So they came running, and the Chinese were coming down, and, and they didn't know they ran into, uh, you know, that, that we were moving up. So this was the first indication that the Chinese were, were fighting U.S. Marines. And, uh, and they didn't know, and we didn't know. It just, you know, it just happened. And uh, as soon as morning came, why, it was, uh, it was like a turkey shoot. Uh, you know, we called in the, uh, the airplanes, and, you know, we just decimated the poor Chinese. I call them poor Chinese now. Well, about what time? Was this November, early November? This was November 5th, 1950. So this was the first encounter with this new enemy, as it were. Exactly. And so you're a radio operator. You've got, what, three regiments of Marines there? And three. It was a, one division is three regiments with supporting artillery. Just walk me into the Chosen Reservoir, but let me know what the Army is doing. Because I heard the Army was overrun, the 7th uh, Infantry or something. Yeah, well, we, we were, in other words, you figure three, three columns, and there was a whole ridge of high mountains, okay? The Army was on the, uh, on the, on the west side of the mountains, and they were pushing up, from, take Sewell, they were moving north of Sewell. You had this ridge of mountains, and the Marines were in the center, and then the, the South Koreans were on the coast. And, uh, and uh, our objective was to go to the reservoir. And, and go beyond the reservoir was pretty close to the Yalu and the, and the, the, the uh, China border with the Chinese. So we were going to, you know, and then the, the army was going to move up and we were all going to spread out. Uh, when the Chinese come, came across, they would come across with uh, uh, ah, about 400,000 men. Uh, you know, it was, it was, it was heavy. Uh, and these were, these were pretty well trained because they had been combat for years and years and years with, with the Civil War and fighting the Japanese and, you know, these guys were, were well trained. Ill-equipped, though. They were ill-equipped but well trained, but they were good fighters. And, uh, and uh, uh, when they came across, uh, the Army was, uh, and, I, and bear in mind is a lot of the Army, again, was not the U.S. Army well trained. These are occupation troops from PXs. They used to run PXs and, and sell cigarettes and, and, and these type and dance halls and these types of things. And for a good part of the army at that time was these types of people. So they were they were very ill trained at the time. And and the, the, the when the Chinese came across, they just ran right through them. And some of them came across, and we were moving up. And uh, we, were, we, were, we hit the, the Chosin Reservoir, and, and all this time, from November 5th till about uh, December, the first week in December, it started getting colder and colder and colder. And I used to think, you know, for two years, did all my training in the tropics, <laughs> Vieques and landing in the, in the tropics, et cetera, and here, my first combat is in sub-zero weather, which I thought was, uh, you know, kind of ironic. Not at the time, but it was ironic. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we were, you know, we were pretty well positioned and, and uh, uh, it was kind of like, uh, you know, I, I guess equated to uh, uh, the old West when they circled the wagons, you know, against the Indians. And uh, so we had a regiment that was encircled, but we were in pretty good shape because we were, you know, we were compact, very well trained. And, uh, and, and had a lot of close air support, which really saved us. I mean, you talk to the airplanes, and they had napalm, and they strafed, and, uh, and, and uh, whatever. And the Chinese used, uh, they used to call it, uh, uh, they used to attack in waves, human, human waves. And that's how they, they, they won all their wars. Uh, you know, human life didn't mean anything to them. They just kept coming. And you know, with a machine gun, you just keep killing them. I mean, it would stack up, and it was, it was, you know, you wonder why these people do those types of things. And uh, and they were vicious. I mean, they 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 were pretty vicious. But anyway, they couldn't. There was little battles in this and 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 on the on the uh, various hills because they had the hills. You know, they thought they took the high ground, and uh, and guarded the high ground. So it wasn't a complete circle. 
but you had the high ground and, you, and there was all these little battles going on at all the time. But the big problem, the major problem was, uh, was the, the cold, it, you know, it was below zero. <clears throat> and uh, eventually we got our parkers and, and I show you that picture of what a combat group looked like coming back. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we, uh, we uh, the general said, well, you know, I'm glad I did what I did. So he says, we got to get out of here. And, and uh, so they started moving south and it was just one road well, from there to uh, the coast. And the Chinese were all around us, hundreds of thousands of uh, Chinese army. And uh, so we, we moved back to, uh, to, uh, to this, the midpoint position where, and, and there was bridges blown and, you know, I'm, there was a lot of turmoil, et cetera, moving from point A to point B. But uh, the, uh, the uh, once, when you had two regiments banded together and, and we always had air support and uh, we flew out our wounded. And, and so we were never in danger of being overrun because as much as they attacked, they just couldn't crack the line. And, and we had discipline and we had, actually we had well-trained, we probably were the most well-trained military at the time. Because as I said before, I trained for two years, uh, is all this, and, and all my compatriots did the same. There were no draftees and this was an all-volunteer Marine Corps at the time. And again, I don't want to disparage the Army, but, uh, but, uh, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the troops at the time were, were occupation troops in Japan. So anyway, we got the two regiments back and then we hooked up eventually with the third regiment and, uh, and it, that's when they, they gave the speech, you know, they said the Marines are surrounded and, and they're, you know, they're, they're gonna be overrun and General Smith said, uh, you know, retreat hell, I'm just advancing in a different direction, which is in effect, that's what he felt, felt he was doing because he, he could have went anywhere he wanted in this compact group. And, uh, and, you know, since we had the aircraft carriers off the coast and in South uh, Korea, so we had total air support. There was no, you know, they didn't have any air support at all. But uh, they had, uh, one of the mean things, of course, was their mortars. They had, uh, they were very good with their mortars. And uh, these are devilish little things, not little things, they're 120 millimeters sometimes. But the little mortars, you know, what they hit, and they have these little, uh, like little needles, you know, so if you get hit with that, it's, tear you up, it's decimated. And if you get wounded in, in ice cold, that, you know, that that's compounds the damn thing. So anyway, eventually we, you know, and I'm, I'm not going into specifics about... Well, I want to go a little bit into the Rosador. I mean, you guys went up, you came down. I mean, I've heard that they attacked at night. I've heard that, you know, like you said, they weren't well equipped. Uh, they didn't even have really good boots. They had shoes, all these things. But just the actual combat itself I'm interested in because of uh, you, you mentioned these human wave attacks, the machine guns firing, yeah. um, and then what about all the casualties? Are you helping any of them, or the med corpsmen, or what's happening? I mean, our casualties or their casualties? Yours, yours. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. It's uh, you know after I, I mentioned the first attack that we had when they overran the hill, the next morning, uh, you know, we we decimated them and they pulled back, et cetera. We had a from halfway down the hill went up to the top of the hill. And they took care, of, there wasn't too many wounded, but they caught a lot of our guys in a sleeping bag with their burp guns. So there was about 20, 25 guys who got killed in a sleeping bag. And we had to take them and, and help carry them down the hill and, and uh, take care of them. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, not nerve wracking, but it's, uh, it's, you know, the guys that you know, some, some very well and some not so well that, uh, you know, you go down and they laid them out on a road and they were in their sleeping bags with their, little, with their faces, you know, hanging out and then they had tags on the, on the sleeping bags because they kept them in the sleeping bag. And then, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, most military, but specific, specifically Marines, we don't leave our dead or wounded anywhere, you know, we, we take them with us and, uh, and that's what they did. They, you know, got them out mostly by airlift. And this is the first historically uh, major use of helicopters in a war, I mean, uh, preceding uh, Vietnam, and because they didn't use them so much in uh, in World War II, so we used helicopters quite a bit. Whatever you know, they weren't these UEs that they have now, and they had to make a lot of trips in and out. But uh, but uh, they you know they they used them quite a bit. But uh, their their main tactic, if uh, if you were on a hill, their main tactic was a human wave. I mean, they and and psychological. They would come at you at night, and uh, they blow these these 
damn horns who were really frightening, you know, because you knew, you know, they dee -dee -dee, and they didn't blow them until the attack started. And it was, you know, they didn't have any radio, so that's what they used to coordinate their forces. But it was still, you know, push on and push on and push on. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, they, the, uh, they used that tactic to a great extent in, in Vietnam when, uh, when they overran, uh, you know, some of the outposts in Vietnam, the uh, human wave type concept. The uh, North Vietnamese used the same, because they were trained by the Chinese. So uh, it was, uh, you know, I want to say it was, sometimes it was a turkey shoot, but it was, uh, you know, you just wondered, why, why did they keep coming? You know, what, what motivates these people? So the, the whole thing about the Chosen Reservoir geographically was uh, a strategy of MacArthur's or was it just uh, the power plant had value? I mean, why no, 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 no. 38th the, parallel? The, it was the strategy was to, to uh, have the Marine Corps, have the whole, uh, they call them United Nations, have the whole United Nations across the, the, uh, the Korean border from North Korea and Chinese. And, and to, to hold that and, and, and to create uh, one nation out of Korea, no South, North, North Korea, not South Korea. Uh, MacArthur, you know, himself uh, disliked uh, the communists intensely. Hey, everybody hated communists. They were evil people and all that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, the, the Chinese were lined up with the Russians, but the Chinese didn't trust the Russians, and the Russians didn't trust the Chinese. And just... You know, what's happening today insofar as our negotiations with North Korea, I mean, the same type of people are there, the same mindset. These are in, in, ingenious little people, and you can't, you can't bargain with them. You can't negotiate with them because, uh, you know, they don't have, the bottom line is, uh, is total destruction, just like, you know, maybe Iraq, is total destruction. And, uh, and they'll, they'll tease you, and, you know, they use these uh, 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 Chinese-type uh, negotiation tactics but uh, they, 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 their ultimate objective is just to drive you crazy, not to accomplish anything. And our mindset used to be, and it probably still is in some quarters, that you want to sit down and, you know, you, maybe out, out of discussion you can have something common uh, and, uh, and, and come to some sort of conclusion. But, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. One of the things that I was, I was uh, the last, uh, since I was on communication, when we moved back, we moved all our artillery and everything off, and they had a ring of, uh, of ships. They had the Missouri right in the middle, the battleship Missouri, and they had a ring of ships, and these were artillery. And they, would, they could fire and, and have a whole wall of fire and walk it in if, uh, if we got into trouble. So he took all the troops off. Meanwhile, the Chinese had stopped. Uh, you know, they, they, they said, we, we took enough punishment, I guess, and uh, they did. They were decimated. I think there was three major Chinese armies that... Uh, that lost almost 70% of their people, either through wounds or cold or whatever. I mean, just decimated them. And uh, they weren't expecting that. But uh, one of the uh, things that I enjoyed was talking to uh, the battleship Missouri, you know, and, uh, and uh, we were talking and, and they said, well, we want to fire a couple of test shots to, uh, to zero in. And uh, a 16-inch gun on a battleship, you, you just can't fathom what that is like because the ship was almost over the horizon. You couldn't see the ship. And you, hear this, you could hear the damn thing fire. Vroom! And you could actually see the projectile going over you. And it was like a Volkswagen. It was about as big as a Volkswagen. And it, it would go wait, you know, it go and it'd land on target and it, and it was like an earthquake when it hit. And uh, they did that for, for several reasons. But anyway, we pulled back. But I, I mentioned that because I was one of the last people to leave. You know, we pulled everybody back. We had tens of thousands of Koreans pouring onto our, our boats to bring them back to Pusan. And uh, I was one of the last. I remember I left Christmas Eve, 1950. Uh, I was one of the last ones to leave. Got on a boat. And, you know, they had these LSTs, so you got right on the boat on the beach. They, pulled up the thing and started backing off, and then they blew up, you know, the demolition blew up the whole, ha the whole harbor structure, et cetera, as we were pulling out. Mm -hmm. And we said goodbye to that place, you know. And I remember that as we left. Well, how did the cold affect you personally as far as your, your, your weapons, your food, your water? I mean, how did, and the way you fought? I mean, you personally, did you get frostbite? I mean... 
No, I was lucky. Uh, 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 again, uh, a lot of times they train you how to how to how to deal with that. You know, change your big thing, keep your feet warm, change your socks, uh, massage your toes and stuff like that, and change. You know, do a lot of that stuff. Yeah, personal hygiene. Uh, they were extremely. Uh, you know, Marine, you hear a lot about the Marine Corps, but they taught you uh, personal hygiene from the day you go in there. To this day, I can sew buttons on. I sew my own buttons. I can press my own clothes. I take care of myself. I know, you know, all this personal stuff. They teach you to be a, you know, totally independent in individual, which is helpful both in in the service and, and when you get out. And uh, so, uh, as far as that goes, it was it was cold. It was difficult uh, in fighting, uh, you know, because you had gloves on and you had to keep your trigger finger, but. Uh, uh, and then and, and keep the, uh, the the radios warm. You know, we had this old radios you used the generator. You had to crank the generator to get power and that kind of stuff, which they have, you know, they don't use that. But they still have an Anglico. And uh, they they rely less now on uh, on naval gunfire because, uh, first of all, they don't have too much naval gunfire and the whole concept of war has changed. So it's primarily, primarily air. <clears throat> And to this day, uh, and, and, and what they did, what I have in Korea, uh, two things. One, when we went, when we went back to uh, Pusan, uh, they brought in a lot of, uh, 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 to fill in the ranks, they brought in a lot of people, uh, Marines from the States and around to fill out the, uh, the casualties. And for R&R, &R, they, they sent us up to call the, what happened was when, when the Army uh, moved north, they left pockets of gorilla with uh, North Koreans. So we went out on a gorilla hunt, you know, for about three weeks. And, and that was kind of interesting. And they use that, we use that to train the new recruits coming in. Mm -hmm. But uh, we would go out in, uh, in groups of maybe uh, 50. And, uh, and, 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 and again, you know, we would chase them during the daytime and then we'd form a circle at night they would chase us. Uh, the gorillas would come down, and, and uh, that was that was kind of exciting. That was like Indian. And why why is Korea referred to as the Forgotten War? Well, it's pretty obvious because it was forgotten uh, uh, to the extent that uh, even when it was going on, it was forgotten. And and I and I and I I'd like to to uh, give you one little anecdote. Uh, when I came back from Korea after after a year and a half, a year or so in Korea. Uh, came back and, and we landed in uh, California, San Francisco, and, and I took, I think it was a DC-3. And in those days, they called them non-sked airlines. So you, you bought a ticket, for, I think, for $99 from, from San Francisco to New York, except this thing was like a Greyhound bus. It, it would fly to Dallas, and then somebody would call from Cincinnati. It would go up to Cincinnati, pick up somebody, and it would go like that. It took about three days four days to get from San Francisco to New York. And, uh, and you're in the plane all that time. So uh, I got off the plane, landed at LaGuardia, uh, and got into a taxi cab. And I remember this distinctly. I, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a war veteran, and, and the, the, the war is my, my total uh, thought process for a year and a half. That's all I thought about. And you assume that's everybody's thought process. So uh, I'm in the cab, and the cabbie had a baseball game on. I remember this to this day. And it was the day that Bobby Thompson hit the home run and put the Giants in the World Series. And there was a lot of stuff on the radio. And then after that happened, he turned the radio off. He says, well, wh where have you been? Uh, how, where are you coming from? I just got back from Korea. And, and he said, Korea, is that still going on? You know, so I thought to myself, gee whiz, <laughs> not too many people are thinking about it. But, you know, it wasn't, it was, it was a different mindset at the time. Korea and Korea veterans are more tied in and tuned in to World War II guys. We used the same equipment, you know, it's only five years after World, the end of World War II. So we used the same equipment, the same analogy, analogy and, and, and whatever. The guys in Vietnam after Korea, then, then they have a whole different take. But uh, we were pretty much aligned. And so, you know, when, when I enlisted for three years and they gave me an extra year, um, it was, you know, it was the way it had to be. You didn't even think about it. It was just the government said you have to do this, and you did that. There was no bitching or crying about it. And Tell me about the camaraderie of the Marine Corps when you're in battle. I mean, how part, 
how important is that to survival and, and winning and all that? Oh, it's critical. It is, it is critical. And, and uh, if you study the makeup of the Marine Corps, uh, and this goes back to, I don't know, historical, as far as the Marine Corps is concerned, their, their, their combat operations break down to the lowest, the lowest group is a fire team. It's a four, four people. And, and, a, and a, you have a fire team leader, and then you have a BAR, BAR guy, and you have a rifleman, and you have a, another rifleman. And one of the riflemen is supposed to protect the BAR, Browning Automatic Rifleman guy, which is, and then the, the two riflemen or, or other. And you have four fire team, you have a fire team of four men, then you have four, four fire teams make up a, a platoon. Then you have three platoons make up a company, and then you have, you know, so it goes up the line. But these four guys are almost like brothers. And uh, they live and die with each other. And they, they know to a fault. They know the guy's family, his background, his, uh, his uh, love life, his uh, likes, his dislikes. And they just, you know, just like they grew up together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's critical. In, 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 uh, because as you have heard, maybe more and more, when you're in combat, and, and let me just say this, only 30%, I'd say 30, 35% of people in the military are combat veterans, I mean actual combat veterans. A lot of them, most of them are support in some phase or other. So the combat people are, are just not a breed apart, but they have, uh, they have different uh, outlook and aspect because they have different uh, points of perspective than the other military people. And these are the people that bond together and, uh, and, and live together and, and uh, uh, have gone through experiences, you know, living, dying and, and wounding and, uh, and these types of things. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's just critical. It, it, it makes a big difference. Uh, and, uh, of course, I was, again, very lucky because uh, I had trained uh, with these people and, uh, and it was, you know, it, for two years and going into combat, it was, you know, it was two years of experiencing with these guys and, and the bonding and all that stuff. So uh, it was very, it was very uh, beneficial. And as I said before, the two things is discipline and, 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 uh, and, and training. Uh, you know, you see these movies, <coughs> Iwo Jima, and I certainly wasn't one of these guys, but, uh, but uh, you know, you're, you're, you're laying down and here comes these waves of people. And, and the guy that you would least likely suspect of being heroic, you know, and he was just maybe a, a, a private first class, and he's probably a, a, maybe a screw-up. He would, you know, in, 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 the tw in the prior years, he would go out and drink, he'd get written up, he didn't, you know, get, have to stay in the barracks and all this other stuff. Just wasn't capable of uh, performing in society as, and these are the guys, you know, you, you're laying down there, and this guy truly, you know, I, I, I've seen him. Two guys down, he'd jump up with his, uh, with his BAR and start shooting, you know, the bullets are flying all around, you look at him, this guy's wacko, you know, you're down there, you're, you're doing your part, but you're not, you know, you don't want to get killed. And these guys are, you know, just unbelievable. And you, and you think to yourself, what, what motivates this guy? And he was just, you know, he was a warrior. There are warriors, there are people that, uh, that truly are that type of individual. Uh, it's astounding, uh, you know, it always amazed me. And there, there is always a group of people that, uh, that, that do that thing. One of the sad part about it, our, our regiment was, was I'd say 77, 70 percent made up of reserves called back in. And uh, a lot of these, most of these people had, were married and had families. And, uh, and of course, you know, happy-go-lucky 20-year-old, 21-year-old, uh, didn't have, you know, you have your mother and father and stuff, but you didn't have any waves, you know, didn't have responsibilities. But uh, to see these guys shot up and, and, and either, either wounded or killed, and, and you know they've got families and children, and, you know, you, you, that's when it bothers you a lot, too. Uh, so it, it, it you know, it, it stays with you as, as far as combat is concerned. There are a lot of things that... Uh, that you don't know that, uh, that bother you. In fact, you know, when I came back, it took me, I'd say, about five years to get normal again. To, uh, you know, it used to be, you know, you'd hear a, a backfire or something and, and you just instinctively want to jump and, and fall on the ground. It's just, you know, it, it's a life-saving thing when you're there, 
but uh, it stays with you. It takes you that long to, uh, to, 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 to eliminate it. Was it hard for you to talk about the war after the war, or is it recently that maybe you'll talk about it, or? Not really, I, you know, uh, and, and again, it wasn't, uh, it was, first of all, I volunteered to go. I was well trained, uh, and, 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 and really, uh, as far as going to Korea, uh, you know, I volunteered. I, I volunteered to go in the Marine Corps, and then when, when uh, it broke out, they asked for volunteers to flesh out these things, and, and they had more volunteers than they, uh, than, than they had room for. And, and it was just one of the, you know, it was a mindset. Uh, you know, we trained for two years, now we get a chance to use our training and, and go to war and be a warrior. And, uh, you know, it's just a certain group of people that feel like that. So, uh, you know, and then when I got there, I, I wanted to get out. <laughs> You know, I, I, you know, this is not like the John Wayne movies, that, you know, that you go home after the movie. It's, you know, you have to stay there. And it became very uncomfortable. And, uh, and uh, over a period of time, you know, it wears on you, especially uh, after a year of constant, you know, battles and going here and there. You never knew what, uh, what uh, you never knew what the strategy was. Uh, you never knew, you know, you just get up here, we're going to lay here. You're going to sleep here tonight. And, you know, you dig a little hole in it. You wake up and brush the snow away, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, but you always had a job and you always had your friends. Uh, again, you, you, you mentioned camaraderie. You always had that. And one of the things that, uh, that really made an impression on me and, and changed probably my whole life was uh, my life's perspective. Uh, uh, was one time we were on top of a hill and, and there was about three or four days. We didn't have any hot food and it was cold and hell and uh, uh, they managed to bring up from the rear uh, a, a, a mess group you know with, with hot coffee and, and stuff like that we hadn't seen that and and we had a chance uh, we took turns going down the hill and uh, and getting your, your stuff and coming back and when my turn came I went down you had your canteen cup you know your mess kit it filled with hot coffee and you put your plate out and they threw some slop on it but it was hot and I went over, you know, and sit, put the coffee down. I was sitting under a rock, and I was, I was, <laughs> I was eating this stuff, you know, not mess, not the, your GI stuff. It was just, it was hot food. And I was thinking to myself, I was the happiest guy in the world. You know, I, I couldn't have asked for anything better. And I thought, you know, what a simpleton, you know, how, how, how little you need in life to make you happy. And a thought crossed my mind, and I always go back to that, and, and, uh, the way it colored my life is, uh, is I never aspired to conquer the world. I never aspired to make a lot of money. I always made a good, you know, got a, got a good salary and, and, uh, and uh, did well. But I was always involved in, 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 in community affairs. President of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Chairman of the United Way, uh, all these charities, uh, you know, my whole history was that. Even to the point of, uh, of one of the rationales for me getting into public service. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I always go back to that one instance when, when, you, when you figure you really don't need a whole hell of a lot in life to, to, to be happy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's all in the mind. And, uh, and that colored, you know, and I really colored my, uh, my, uh, my outlook. Mm -hmm. Let's start kind of winding down here, but what, what do you think people should remember about Korea? Well, I don't know if it's anything to remember. I mean, history moves on, and, and today history moves so fast. Uh, I, I think uh, you should remember uh, uh, how we got into Korea, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and, and it was, Korea was the first political war that we fought. Coming from World War II, World War II, the whole country was behind us, and, and uh, everybody, you know, we had rationing, and we had uh, uh, victory, uh, you know, buy bonds, and, and we had, you know, it was, everything was patriotism. The military was, was like God. You, if you were in the military, you couldn't, if you were hitchhiking, you'd get picked up, and if you were in a restaurant, you couldn't pay for your meals, and, and all this stuff. The whole country was like that. Korea wasn't like that, you know. After World War II and everybody, the, the, the troops came back and they got rid of all the military, you know, they downsized the whole military, Navy, Army, Marine Corps, etc. Uh, gave away all our artillery and stuff and put the ships in dry dock and all that stuff. Uh, and then when Korea started again, it was a quick, 
you know, a quick, let's, let's, let's get um, ginned up. But the, the population was not involved in it. In other words, it was a political war that uh, the military weren't allowed to win. They were, you know, they had, to, they had specifics because the Chinese and this, the United Nations, and, and it was a, it, there was a, a, a handicap on the military that you could only do certain things. You, could only bomb, you couldn't bomb across this and that and the other thing. So uh, uh, if you want to study the military, you can uh, how we got, you know, that's how we got from Korea to Vietnam. Vietnam was 10 times worse as far as uh, handicapping the military because... Uh, we probably could have won that in about a year and a half if we, you know, turned loose our, our wherewithal. Should we have been there? I don't know. As far as Korea is concerned, I don't know if we even should have been there. Uh, you know, but, but what happened is, uh, is uh, the Secretary of State at the time drew a line and said, this is our area of interest, and he left out Korea. So everybody thought, well, Korea, they don't care about Korea, so we'll do what we got to do. And, uh, and you got to remember the mindset. What we should remember, uh, we should remember um, if, again, and the Vietnam, Vietnam guys are the same, uh, if you're going to commit America to a, to a combat, you should, you should commit them to win at any cost and, uh, and, and not handicap them politically. Uh, Vietnam was a, was a terrible, you know, we really won the Vietnamese war. There wasn't a battle we lost until we, we were forced out politically. And uh, if you look at today, it's the same thing is happening uh, to a greater extent. And uh, my fear is that uh, uh, patriotism is on the decline, uh, respect for the military is on the decline. And, uh, and, uh, but if you, if you could see some of the ships we've got, go board ships, or talk to some of the young people we have in the service now, you know, they're world class. They're, they're just well trained and, and motivated and, and just unbelievable people. That that would and and again, they're not they're not out to uh, to uh, win a bunch of money or or get this. They're out because they believe in the country. They believe in their mission. And uh, I have nothing but obviously utmost respect for for anybody in the military today. And and again, it's made a profound effect on me and my thought process. And I hope through this thing, uh, uh, the young kids in school that have not been, you know, been, been involved in this or participated in this might have a chance to take, you know, on their own, pick up a book and read type things and then, and then uh, maybe look at their grandfather and, and their father and say, boy, you guys were great because you allowed me to do these things and keep my freedom and, uh, and uh, which I haven't even given, you know, given any thought to. And I, and I should, because it's important. Uh, you know, we, we, it's, freedom is uh, expensive. And there's a lot of people that laid down their life to do that. And they're not, you know, the people that died today and the people that died in all the other wars uh, are not people that, again, were out to make a buck. I mean, you just can't understand that. I mean, you got to get that across, that uh, patriotism and love of country and love of freedom is, uh, is something that, uh, you can't buy, you can't, you know, it's something instilled in you. And unless we instill in the coming generations that thought process, uh, we're not gonna survive as a nation because there's a lot of bad people in this world and, uh, and they have a fervor that they really wanna destroy us. They don't like what we're doing, they don't like how we do it, and they're jealous of us, probably jealous of us because of all of the goodies that we have. And, uh, and they're out to destroy us. So. Uh, Again, it's, uh, it's something that we have to start teaching our children in, in, in school. Totally agree with that. Thank you for that. I'm just about out of time. I wanted to ask you to do one more thing that I ask all the veterans to do from where you're seated because of where the camera's at. Can I ask you to look into the camera and give me a salute when I tell you to? From where you're at? Okay. Can I stand up? Um, because of the camera. Okay. You want to, it's just because of the camera it's down. If it's, I understand you should be standing. Of course, you know, a Marine never salutes uncovered. I know. Do you have a hat? I brought my hat. Well, don't get up. You got a mic on you. There you go. Okay, and right into the camera. Great. Thank you. Okay. 
Now stay there. I'm going to take a picture with this camera, okay? Okay.